are these people? Did you did you watch Julian Assange's address Tuesday? I did, I did not. So this will well, be very interesting cool. to see what he has to say because we've been waiting for him to say boo for months. Now. Right. So. Well, he was at the Committee of Legal Affairs and Human Rights of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, a.k.a. PACE. You'll hear that abbreviation coming forward. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, a lot to get to. But um, we'll start with... Um, in the description below is the link to the entire transcript of his statements, his questions. We're not going to go through all of it because we would be here for 45 minutes. Um, but you know, you're welcome to go through that yourself. Um, and we're probably going to watch this at speeds in human speeds. So that'll be fun to hear what Julian sounds like sped up. So, but you know, we'll see, but here he is. And here's was his opening statements. So let's go ahead and playback speed. We'll do 1.25. Um, so if it took, did it take? No, it just skipped a slide. Yay, I love when it does that. Um, play. Mr. Chairman. Here, settings. Playback speed, 1.25. Play. Esteemed members of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, ladies and gentlemen. The transition from years of confinement in a maximum security prison to being here before the representatives of 46 nations and 700 million people is a profound and a surreal shift. The experience of isolation for years in a small cell is difficult to convey. It strips away one's sense of self leaving only the raw essence of existence. I am yet not fully equipped to speak about what I have endured, <clears throat> the relentless struggle to stay alive, both physically and mentally, nor can I speak yet about the deaths by hanging, murder, and medical neglect of my fellow prisoners. I apologize in advance if my words falter or if my presentation lacks the polish you might expect from such a distinguished forum. Isolation has taken its toll, <clears throat> which I am trying to unwind, and expressing myself in this setting is a challenge. However, the gravity of this occasion and the weight of the issues at hand compel me to set aside my reservations and speak to you directly. I have traveled a long way, literally and figuratively, to be before you today. Before our discussion or answering any questions you might have, I wish to thank Pace for its 2020 resolution, which stated that my imprisonment set a dangerous precedent for journalists and noted that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture called for my release. I'm also grateful for PACE's 2021 statement, expressing concern over credible reports that US officials discussed my assassination, again calling for my prompt release. And I commend the Legal Affairs and Human Rights Committee for commissioning a renowned rapporteur, Suna Ivers' daughter, to investigate the circumstances surrounding my detention and conviction and the consequent implications for human rights. However, like so many of the efforts made in my case, whether they were from parliamentarians, presidents, prime ministers, the Pope, UN officials and diplomats, unions, legal and medical professionals, academics, activists or citizens, none of them should have been necessary. None of the statements, resolutions, reports, films, articles, events, fundraisers, protests, and letters over the last 14 years should have been necessary. But all of them were necessary because without them, I never would have seen the light of day. This unprecedented global effort was needed because the legal protections of the legal protections that did exist, many existed only on paper, were not effective in any remotely reasonable time. Any questions? Not a question, but a comment. Okay. Uh, I don't want to sound ungrateful. I don't want to sound like it, it. I get it. He. I don't know. Like he just sounds too phoned in for me here. Like. Mm. I can understand why 
because I'm sure there's a lot. I think it's part of his plea deal. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff he's not allowed to say. But right. all the same, it just seems like emotionless in what he was saying. Like it just seems yeah. like it doesn't seem real to me that he went through what he went through. I figured there would be a lot more I don't know, type of emotion. It's a very it's, polished it's, speech so far. It, it, it's too Which, polished and too dry. It's like it doesn't seem it it does it only seems like he was in prison for maybe like a day versus like close to what well it definitely didn't kill his sharpness i don't think so far so no you know which was um, we which, worried which was what we were worried about for a long time given what we were hearing you know yeah. the experience of his health so i mean obviously he's out now so he's had time to kind of recoup and like at least start healing but right. I would imagine with what he had to experience. Well, you had a mini stroke. I mean, I think, you know, generally doing pretty well there, if that's the case. Well, I mean, you know? my mom had a mini stroke, too, and she recovered fairly, like, within days. So that's one. So yeah. Not to say that's impossible, but given the combination of everything, that you, I figured he would be a little more... I don't know. And it probably is just me a little bit more raw than how well, he, he gets into some, some questions and he's a little more off the cuff there. So we'll get okay. into that into a bit. Okay. But this is definitely his like premeditated statements. Mm -hmm. um, so let's do this. Um, Oh, I can't hear it. You can't hear it? No. Okay. Let me redo that then. I'm here, here, here. I eventually chose freedom over unrealizable justice. After being detained for years and facing a 175 year sentence, with no effective remedy. Justice for me is now precluded as the US government insisted in writing into its plea agreement that I cannot file a case at the European Court of Human Rights or even a Freedom of Information Act request over what it did to me as a result of its extradition request. I want to be totally clear I am not free today because the system worked. I am free today after years of incarceration because I pled guilty to journalism. I pled guilty to seeking information from a source. I pled guilty to obtaining information from a source. And I pled guilty to informing the public what that information was. <clears throat> I did not plead guilty to anything else. I hope my testimony today can serve to highlight the weakness, the weaknesses of the existing safeguards and to help those whose cases are less visible but who are equally vulnerable. As I emerge from the dungeon of Belmarsh, the truth now seems less discernible and I regret how much ground has been lost during that time period, how expressing the truth has been undermined, attacked, weakened, and diminished. I see more impunity, more secrecy, more retaliation for telling the truth, and more self-censorship. It is hard not to draw a line from the US government's prosecution of me, it's crossing, crossing the Rubicon by internationally criminalizing journalism, to the chilled climate for freedom of expression that exists now. You you catch all that? I did. I, this is why I feel like this speech is phoned in because he's saying, "I'm guilty for telling the truth." Right. That's nothing that you. It's not to say he's ashamed of it, but and he basically saying the law, justice won. 
And it's like, no, because that's still an issue now. That's an issue for us, even yeah. now, in independent media. It's like, you get punished for telling the truth. Yeah. Um, so, again, I, I want to be very respectful to him, considering what he went through. But, and I, again, I'm sure there's a lot that he cannot <clears throat> say in order well, to. Well, specifically, him. he's not allowed to, like, talk about, he's not allowed to ask about anything about what they did to him. FOIA requests are not allowed by him, essentially. I don't know how that uh, goes along with Stefania Moriti's FOIA requests. If she's able to do that, right? Like, I don't know if it's just him, but I know he's not allowed to, like, file suit over any of this. Essentially, right. was, like, part of the plea deal. So, but he's essentially stating that, like, justice didn't win. Like, I had to plead guilty to journalism, you know? So, uh, you know, we're not sure the ramifications of that still. Uh, you know, we've heard both yay and nay that, it, that it's not going to do anything. That it's not going to change precedent, and we've heard that it will change precedent. So we'll see. But here's here's a bit more Julian to kind of explain some more. Um, let's go to here, here. When I founded WikiLeaks, it was driven by a simple dream to educate people about how the world works, so that through understanding, we might bring about something better. Having a map of where we are, let us understand where we might go. <clears throat> <clears throat> Knowledge empowers us to hold power to account and to demand justice where there is none. We obtained and published truths about tens of thousands of hidden casualties of war and other unseen horrors, about programs of assassination, rendition, torture and mass surveillance. We revealed not just when and where these things happened, but frequently the policies, the agreements and the structures behind them. When we published Collateral Murder, the infamous gun camera footage of a US Apache helicopter crew eagerly blowing to pieces Iraqi journalists and their rescuers, the visual reality of modern warfare shocked the world. But we also used interest in this video to direct people to the classified policies for when the US military could deploy lethal force in Iraq, how many civilians could, and how many civilians could be killed before gaining higher approval. In fact, 40 years of my potential 175 year sentence was for obtaining and releasing those policies. The practical political vision I was left with after being immersed in the world's dirty wars and secret operations is simple. Let us stop gagging, torturing and killing each other for a change. Get these fundamentals right and other political, economic and scientific processes Will have space to take. <clears throat> will have space to take care of the rest. WikiLeaks' work was deeply rooted in the principles that this assembly stands for. Our journalism elevated freedom of information and the public's right to know. It found its natural operational home in Europe. I lived in Paris, and we had formal corporate registrations in France and in Iceland. Our journalistic and technical staff was spread throughout Europe. We published to the world from servers based in France, in Germany, and in Norway. So, specifying where he had, like, the servers located, where he was publishing from, and how the U.S. still extradited him, even though he's not an American citizen. Right? So you have to keep in mind who he's talking to, right? This is the like parliamentary, you know, European Union thing, right? So he's appealing to them to act on, you know, their findings, essentially. Um, so any any comment so far? No, I, I... yeah, I'm. Again, I'm just kind of, I guess, dis I'm not surprised, but I, I'm disappointed. Um, yeah, I, 
I think once you get, you know, further into it a little bit, like, especially to the questions, he seems much more off the cuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I get your first foray being like, you wrote this out to make sure you know what you were saying. And, you know, like, I don't think he's holding anything back necessarily, you know? So, but, yeah, let's, let's let him continue. But 14 years ago, the United States military arrested one of our alleged, alleged whistleblowers, Private First Class Manning, a U.S. intelligence analyst based in Iraq. The U.S. government concurrently launched an investigation against me and my colleagues. The U.S. government illicitly sent planes of agents to Iceland, paid bribes to an informer to steal our legal and journalistic work product, and without formal process, pressured banks and financial services to block our subscriptions and to freeze our accounts. The UK government took part in some of this retribution. It admitted at the European Court of Human Rights that it had unlawfully spied on my UK lawyers during this time. Ultimately, this harassment was legally groundless. President Obama's Justice Department chose not to indict me, recognizing that no crime had been committed. The United States had never before prosecuted a publisher for publishing or obtaining government information. To do so would require a radical and ominous reinterpretation of the US Constitution. In January 2017, Obama also commuted the sentence of Manning, who had been convicted of being one of my sources. So, I mean, just kind of reiterating some history, right? Sure. Um, what else we got? However, in February 2017, the landscape changed dramatically. President Trump had been elected. <clears throat> he appointed two wolves in MAGA hats. Mike Pompeo, a Kansas congressman and former arms industry executive. Pay attention, Trump supporters. And William Barr, a former CIA officer as U.S. Attorney General. By March 2017, WikiLeaks had exposed the CIA's infiltration of French political parties. It's spying on French and German leaders. It's spying on the European Central Bank, European <laughs> Economics Ministries, and its standing orders to spy on French industry as a whole. He revealed the CIA's vast production of malware and viruses, its subversion of supply chains, its subversion of antivirus software, cars, smart TVs, and iPhones. CIA Director Pompeo launched a campaign of retribution. It is now a matter of public record that under Pompeo's explicit direction, the CIA drew up plans to kidnap and to assassinate me within the Ecuadorian embassy in London and authorize going after my European colleagues, subjecting us to theft, hacking attacks, and the planting of false information. My wife and my infant son were also targeted. A CIA asset was permanently assigned to track my wife and instructions were given to obtain DNA from my six month old son's nappy. This is the testimony of more than 30 current and former U.S. intelligence officials speaking to the U.S. press, which has been additionally corroborated by records seized in the prosecution brought against some of the CIA agents involved. The CIA's targeting of myself, my family, and my associates through aggressive extrajudicial and extraterritorial means provides a rare insight into how powerful intelligence organizations engage in transnational repression. Such repressions are not unique. What is unique is that we know so much about this one due to numerous whistleblowers and to, to judicial investigations in Spain. This assembly is no stranger to extraterritorial abuses by the CIA. PACE's groundbreaking report on CIA renditions in Europe exposed how the CIA operated secret detention centers and conducted unlawful renditions on European soil, violating human rights and international law. In February this year, the alleged source of some of our CIA revelations, former CIA officer Joshua Schulte, was sentenced to 40 years in prison under conditions of extreme isolation. His windows are blacked out 
and a white noise machine plays 24 hours a day over his door so that he cannot even shout through it. These conditions are more severe than those found in Guantanamo Bay. But transnational repression is also conducted by abusing legal processes. The lack of effective safeguards against this means that Europe is vulnerable to having its mutual legal assistance and extradition treaties hijacked by foreign powers to go after dissenting voices in Europe. In Michael Pompeo's memoirs, which I read in my prison cell, the former CIA director bragged about how he pressured the US Attorney General to bring an extradition case against me in response to our publications about the CIA. Indeed, exceeding to Pompeo's requests, the US Attorney General reopened the investigation against me that Obama had closed and re-arrested Manning, this time as a witness. Manning was held <clears throat> in a prison for over a year, fined $1,000 a day in a formal attempt to coerce her into providing secret testimony against me. She ended up attempting to take her own life. We usually think of attempts to force journalists to testify against their sources. But Manning was now a source being forced to testify against their journalist. By December 2017, CIA Director Pompeo had got his way and the US government issued a warrant to the UK for my extradition. The UK government kept the warrant secret from the public for two more years while it, the US government, and the new president of Ecuador moved to shape the political, the legal, and the diplomatic grounds for my arrest. When powerful nations feel entitled to target individuals beyond their borders, those individuals do not stand a chance unless there are strong safeguards in place and a state willing to enforce them. Without this, no individual has a hope of defending themselves against the vast resources of, that a state aggressor can deploy. <coughs> if the situation... <coughs> If the situation were not already bad enough in my case, the US government asserted a danger, dangerous new global legal position. Only US citizens have free speech rights. Europeans and other nationalities do not have free speech rights. But the US claims its Espionage Act still applies to them regardless of where they are. So Europeans in Europe must obey US secrecy law with no defenses at all as far as the US government is concerned. An American in Paris can talk about what the US government is up to, perhaps. But for a French man in Paris, to do so is a crime with no defense, and he may be extradited just like me. Any questions? No. 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 We got one more clip. OK. Go ahead. I mean, this um, is you know we know so yeah most of us do i think the, i think the thing is that like this hasn't been talked about in any official like organizations yet you know so i do feel like it's important just to kind of get the record down for for that you know right but um yeah i mean like Watching this live for me was definitely surreal, you know? Sure. Like, you haven't heard this guy speak in, in 14 years, practically. So, you know, to me, it's a big deal to hear it, you know? Yeah. But Now that one foreign government has formally asserted that Europeans have no free speech rights, a dangerous precedent has been set. Other powerful states will inevitably follow suit. The war in Ukraine has already seen the criminalization of journalists in Russia. But based on the precedent set in my extradition, there is nothing to stop Russia, or indeed any other state, from targeting European journalists, publishers, or even social media users by claiming that their domestic secrecy laws have been violated. 
the rights of journalists and publishers within the European space are seriously threatened. Transnational repression cannot become the norm here. As one of the world's two great norm-setting institutions, PACE must act. The criminalization of news gathering activities is a threat to investigative journalism everywhere. I was formally convicted by a foreign power for, for asking for, receiving, and publishing truthful information about that power while I was in Europe. The fundamental issue is simple. Journalists should not be prosecuted for doing their jobs. Journalism is not a crime. It is a pillar of a free and informed society. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, if Europe is to have a future where the freedom to speak and the freedom to publish the truth are not privileges enjoyed by a few, the rights guaranteed <laughs> must act so that what has happened in my case never happens to anyone else. I wish to express my deepest gratitude to this assembly, to the conservatives, social democrats, liberals, leftists, greens and independents who have supported me throughout this ordeal and to the countless individuals who have advocated tirelessly, tirelessly for my release. It is heartening to know that in a world often divided by ideology and interests, there remains a shared commitment to the protection of essential human liberties. Freedom of expression and all that flows from it is at a dark crossroad. I fear that unless institutions like PACE wake up to the gravity of the situation, it will be too late. Let us all commit to doing our part to ensure that the light of freedom never dims, that the pursuit of truth will live on, and that the voices of the many are not silenced by the interests of the few. Well, that's his statement. So we're going to get into more off the cuff things here in a second. You could tell why I'm not happy with that last clip, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, look, where has he been getting his information for 14 years? Right. I don't, I don't think they just let him, you know, get on the interwebs while he's locked up, you know? So he's getting all of this in the span of, a month or so right and this lady has already put up plenty of stuff in regards to navalny that people were not happy about so yeah you know uh, uh, look he's going to be talking to other journalists i hope I, and i hope they set both of them straight would be nice on that i i don't want julian russia phobing you know but I, I think I get why he's telling the European group that, you know, but at like, yeah, especially when, you know, UK is detaining journalists now for that. Correct. Correct. So not the best in that regard, but any thoughts before we head to the, the Q and a, no, I mean, Yeah, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I think your expectations were a little high, too. No, you know? they weren't. No, they weren't. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't no. high at all. But, I mean, just, again, considering what you want, I, maybe, it, maybe now thinking about it, I think, but we kind of suspected I, this was going to happen, you know, yeah. but... The idea would be like <laughs> coming out with fire and brimstone, basically being like, "Yeah, you I motherfuckers know. did this they, bullshit." Like, basically. yeah, would be nice, you um, know. But no such luck, I guess. Yeah, I think he, it's also the room he's in. You can't quite go that hard in right. there, you know. But. But like, I, you know what? I don't think I would be as bothered at this. And I think I figured it out. If he has, th this was basically his first yeah. speaking thing. No, on camera, was, anywhere. On camera since he was released. We were thinking, oh, he's out. He's going to be speaking within like 
a day or giving a, a press statement or something. No such thing. He went back to Australia. Now, granted, he first thing, if I was going to be in prison for that long, obviously I would want to see my family and all of that and enjoy that. So, yeah. fine. But, like, but it's been what? Like, over two months since he's been out? And, like, now, it, now this is the first statement that he's been given, or I would I say allowed to <laughs> Um, right. Since he's been acquitted. So I think this I think this just really fell flat for me because it's just kind of like we've been I think people were waiting and waiting and waiting and people were just like, okay, yeah, it's a bit anticlimactic yeah. in some respects. Like but, well, little, you know, too little too late type of thing. Sure. Um but yeah, well Here's his, you know, Q and A with. Uh, no, I think only members of of Pace were allowed to ask, and then I think, like, there's still rapporteurs of Pace. Like, it wasn't any of the members of the public. That's what I'm waiting for. I would like to get interviews with Stefania, with Consortium, with like the people that I think really deserve talking to him. Like, I, I want someone talking to him and asking him questions. And, you know, that's what I would prefer. But, yeah, here's his, here's his, some of the responses for why he wanted to be there. Um, I am here because I believe it is an essential first step for Pace to act, uh, to get the ball rolling, uh, to address the problems of transnational repression, and also to make it clear that national security journalism is possible <coughs> within European borders. Um, as for my re-adaptation to the big wide world outside of house arrests and embassy siege and maximum security prison, it sure takes some adjustment. Um, it's not simply the spooky sound of electric cars. They are very spooky. Um, but it's the, it is also the change in the society. The, where we once produced a important, uh, where we once released an important war crimes videos um, that stirred public debate. Now, every day, there are live stream horrors from the wars in Ukraine and the war in Gaza. Hundreds of journalists have been killed in Gaza and Ukraine combined. The impunity one quite a bit more than the other seems to mount and it is still uncertain what we can do about it uh we know a readaptation to mm -hmm. the world of course includes some positive but still tricky things becoming a father again to children who have grown up without me becoming a husband again, even dealing with a mother-in-law. <laughs> These are trying family issues. No, she's, she's a very lovely woman. I like her, I like her very much. <laughs> uh-huh. Thank you, Mrs. Assange. Uh, could I call upon Mr. Kleinwacher? But, yeah, I mean, she shut that mic off quick. Like, before before you dig your hole too quickly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, that felt a much more off the cuff. You know? Yeah, I mean, it humanized him a bit. You know, which is yeah. great. Um... 
I don't know. I'm kind of torn even with that, though, because, and I'm only saying this because, yeah, I mean, I'm going to get a little personal here. Like, someone like my dad, who has made it his life's work, essentially, to, uh, he's Pan-African. So, you know, so him, for him, the movement that is Pan-Africanism has, I think, it's taken a huge, it's defined who he is in terms of being a Black man. Uh, he's back in home in Barbados now, but, you know, like, his working life is in London. And I believe he made the decision, you know, in terms of definitely by the time I was born you know, like, to either be with family or choose the movement. And in my opinion, he chose the movement. Now, I think for me, the effect of not, you know, not necessarily I knew who he was, is, but obviously, you know, him essentially kind of being committed to the movement versus his family in certain ways, I think, could be argued as maybe wrong. And and I think when I was a lot younger, I would have believed that, oh, he should have chose his family. And I'm not entirely sure if I still think that way now, but now, as an adult, I can kind of understand why. And right. I think and I'm saying that because I believe, I, in my heart, feel like Julian had to make a similar choice yeah. to choose the movement or essentially well. be comfortable. And it really, he w didn't even have the choice himself. It was chosen no. for him. No. You know? Right. And so my thing is, are you going to accept that role or essentially be comfortable in the family? And you can make the case for evil or. Yeah. But, and I get it. His kids are young. And there was a point where we didn't know if Julian was would alive. see them. Yeah. Right. So I understand and respect the idea of him wanting to see his family. That I totally get. But what I also get is if his kids will grow up to be anything like me, they will grow up to understand what their father was doing and the legacy that essentially he was trying, he is leaving behind for them is the idea yeah. of, as Indy has in his X bio, like, you know, journalism is not a crime. Yeah. And I think once they come to that understanding as adults in light of understanding their dad and what he was in jail for. I would like to think they would get it. Right. So, so again, it's, I'm torn because I can make the case for both. And I don't think really there it really is a right or wrong answer here. So that's why I'm kind of going to, so while in certain ways I am disappointed, like I also want to be fair because chances are I'll never be in the position where Julian would be. And I don't know what in his mind he was probably thinking in terms of you may, making this deal in order for him to be released. Like, I will ne probably will never be in that position. And, but again, it's still the idea of this issue was because it, it was, gonna, it was, it's bigger than him at this point. And, yeah. So it was the idea of like, 
would you be able to follow up within that legacy? And yeah, you would lose, I think you would be sacrificing a lot, but what would you gain in terms of having journalism in of itself be more of a reflection of what it should be versus what it has become in terms of being a slave essentially to the establishment and corporations. So I, man, I mean, it's hard and I cannot, it just makes me happy. More than likely, I would never be placed in that position. Yeah. But again, I make the case for both. But I think if anything, I do wonder, like, if Julian, as we said, said, fuck it, I'm just going to go off and speak my truth. And I'm sure right. there is that truth there. But as I said, it was phoned in. Like, well, I just wonder, like, I think it was just more we, put together, less phoned in necessarily, but like mm -hmm. prepared, you sure. know, that's what it seems like to me, you know, and yes, I would like to hear off the cuff stuff, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to get comfortable enough to do that. And I'd like him to talk to some folks. Like, I've not seen that happen yet. You know, he's been kind of isolated. So when he's ready to reintroduce himself, that would be nice. Um, but I have one last clip before his closing statements. Um, and this is about technology, which Assange has always been kind of connected with, right? You know, you know, he was screaming about AI and all that stuff before everyone, you know, really saw that. So I think with that, he actually still has, you know, pretty good grasp on things. So um, let's go to that, and here we go. I'm very interested in technology. Um, I was a computer scientist from a young age, and studied mathematics and physics, uh, cryptography. Um, it's with that cryptography that uh, we set about our system to protect sources and protect our own organization. Um, I am um, enthused about some of the developments that are happening with cryptography. Some of those developments provide alternatives to what we see as huge media power and concentration in the hands of a few billionaires. Um, they are still embryonic. Other technologies emerged out of the campaign against mass surveillance uh, through, and the Big Bang was the Snowden revelations that radicalized engineers and programmers uh, in many places who saw themselves as agents of history uh, in including algorithms to protect uh, people's privacy, uh, including the communications between journalists and their sources. Um, on the other hand, as I emerge from prison, I see that artificial intelligence uh, is being used to create mass assassinations, where before there was the difference between assassination and warfare, um, now the two are conjoined. Um, when, where many, perhaps the majority of targets uh, in Gaza um, are bombed as a result uh, of artificial intelligence targeting. The connection between artificial intelligence and surveillance uh, is important. Um, artificial intelligence needs information to um, come up with targets or ideas or propaganda. Um, and when we're talking 
um, about uh, the use of artificial intelligence con to conduct mass assassinations, um, surveillance data from telephones, internet, uh, is key to training those algorithms. So uh, there's um, a lot has uh, changed. Some things have remained the same. There's a lot of opportunity um, <coughs> and a lot of risk. Uh, I'm still trying to understand where we are, but hopefully we'll have something more useful to say in due course. Thank you, Mr. Assange. Now, there was an indication from another member of the assembly. Could um, but that, that I felt like he, he had together. He mentioned Lavender AI. Yep. Um, not by name, but by practice. And uh, talked about that on this show. And among many of AI targeting and the information they use, but that was that was great from him, in my opinion. You know, uh -huh. so. But yeah, he had very short closing statements, which we can get to, and wrap this up. Um, so let me set that up, and. Go here, pull this up, and action. In 2010, I was living in Paris. I went uh, to the United Kingdom and never came back until now. Um, it's Good to be back. It's good to be amongst people who, as we say in Australia, who give a damn. It's good to be amongst friends. And I would just like to thank all the people who have fought for my liberation and who have understood, importantly, uh, that my liberation was coupled to their own liberation. Uh, that the basic fundamental liberties which sustain us all have to be fought for and that when one of us falls through the cracks soon enough those cracks will widen and take the rest of us down um, so thank you for your thought your courage in this and other settings and uh, keep up the fight Well, that that was the uh, hearing. I, I did want to mention they had one of the uh, UK rapporteurs um, ask about um, his uh, said specifically, you know, that uh, torture is a serious accusation. Do you have any evidence that Belmarsh tortured you? Right. And like Julian didn't really answer that, um, and he tried to follow up, and and the guy was like, "Well, we told you one question each, pretty much," mm -hmm. and they moved on. And that was the UK guy, right? So I don't know whether that's plea deal stuff that Julian didn't want to answer, or if he just chose not to answer, or you know, didn't even think about it, whatever. Um, it, it seemed kind of targeted from the UK guy, but. You know, um, I forget the the rest of the question about what it pertained to, um, but yeah, I mean, um, 
that was that was his statements. But um, next day happened, Care Bear, and let me go to that. So, oh, this was uh, at the end of it. Was he got a nice little standing O from the crowd? That's always nice, nice. you know. So, but next day. Uh, so they voted on the resolution, the detention and conviction of Julian Assange and the chilling effects on human rights. 88 in favor, 13 against abstentions, right? Uh, Denver Assange, finally it is admitted that Assange was held as a political prisoner, which means he should have never been held at all and that extradition to the U.S. would have indeed violated the U.K. treaty. So I'm not sure what this does yet. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, I don't know if this wipes slate clean, so to speak, or what happens with that. You know, I, I know people are still fighting for a pardon on Assange, so that's important. Um, so, again, you know, recognize as political prisoner. I know Misty kind of put up, obviously, on Twitter. <laughs> that that was the case and that we've been screaming about it forever um so Juan Passarelli this is a huge win if you look at the definition of political prisoner Julian Assange in his case fulfills the definition um Avostador told the assembly he was convicted for engaging in acts of journalism this is a clear instance of a politically motivated incarceration so Again, I don't know how much power this council has and to what effect this will actually do. We'll, we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled um, on, on what that has. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm interested to see what more Julian has to say in the coming months, weeks, years, you know. Um, like just, and who he talks to and information he gets and I just hope that maybe he'll be a little bit more open to kind of share a little bit more other than like what he shared here and people in the chat said you know ha you have to watch the whole thing in order to do it justice so maybe um, I probably should do that just to have a better understanding of you know, probably how Julian was probably feeling and just the way he was speaking here. Yeah. So that being said, though, I do feel like, again, people were waiting for a statement for him for months, only for him to kind of come with this, which, again, understandable. I think people just expected something else, you know, from him. And Sure. And I think considering the circumstances, it makes sense. Um, so that's why I want to be very careful and not judge Julian at all. Because like I said, most of us will never be in a position where he's has yeah. been. And and we don't necessarily I don't necessarily know the choice I would necessarily make in that instance either. Um, but as I said, I do want to validate what people were hoping for, myself included. Um Sure. But, you know, but you're right. I think what does this mean? We'll see. But I hope is, but my hope is it'll be more than something just a symbolic sexy nod that, yeah. Yeah. We get it. But we're not going to yeah. do anything about it. That's right. Or don't have the power to do anything about it or don't, you know. I just hope so, this leads to something more in yeah. terms of, and we'll see. But leads to something more in terms of not being in jail for essentially telling the truth on our leaders. Yep. Well, and I don't, I don't know to what degree he's been. Compromise. You know, uh, yeah. Like as far as not mentally, because I think generally he's together. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like the people around him and the information he gets. Right. You know, there's been issues with WikiLeaks, uh, you know, generally, like, uh, again, I just hope he's around the right people, talks to the right folks and gets a chance to, like, 
reconnect to the journalists that he was a part of, you know, and who worked with uh, worked on this case for so long. I think that's an important thing. I think consortium should be first and center, in my opinion, for an interview, you know. So I hope we just hear more from him and see, you know, how things go for him and and what stuff he can learn while he's free, essentially, so to speak, uh-huh. you know, as free as any of us can be. Um, but I think this is important for him about, uh, like, setting in place extradition stuff, right? Right. You know, so and I think that that makes a difference here to say that he was a political prisoner. That means the UK treaties might still hold some merit. We'll see, because it seems like they can just throw those out whenever they feel like it. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, felt like it was important to make sure that we we all witnessed that and made our own opinions, you know. So, but as always, you know, this is why we're demonetized. You can scan that QR code on your screen. Go to codashfee.com slash Indie News Network. As always, links to donate are in the description below. Give us a little dollary dues and help us keep the lights on. But if you can't do that, you know, uh, just do all the normal stuff that every other YouTuber asks you. Like and subscribe, hitting the share button, leaving comments. You know how it goes by now. We got to have that engagement for things to go well. So get on it. We're working on getting to 3K. So make that number go up. But otherwise, thanks for watching.